Welcome, welcome, welcome to the How to Adult with Travis Walker podcast. I am so excited to start off season two of the How to Adult with Travis Walker podcast. We're going to talk about all kinds of things, new topics. We're going to dive into some old topics. We are going to make this the best season of the How to Adult with Travis Walker podcast ever. And it's going to be amazing. I am so excited. This podcast is with the one and only Amberly Walker. We're going to walk through our journey of pregnancy because it's come to our attention that there are so many people out there that are going through challenges, that are having they're having trouble, they're struggling. And so I want to share and we want to share our story to hopefully inspire and motivate the people out there that are going through these hard times. So with that being said, we are not medical professionals. This is not medical advice. This is for entertainment purposes only. We are trying to motivate and inspire people that are going through hard times. You should seek your own medical advice from doctors and physicians. So go out there, see your doctor, but hopefully this podcast will help you get to where you need to be. I'm so excited for season two. This is going to be an incredible, incredible season. Uh, I decided to take the summer off of my MBA. I'm currently an MBA student. I'm taking the summer off mostly because I've got twins and that's kind of hard and kind of difficult, right? But also because I want to spend some time on the podcast. This is where my heart is, right? And if I can make this podcast profitable, if I can make this podcast amazing, that's what I want to do. So if you want to do an in ad uh, or an in podcast ad, Ad with me, reach out. I'd love to run your ad. I'd r- love to support your business if you support mine, right? So obviously reach out. You can also always hit the contribution button on wherever you're listening to your podcast. Share the podcast. Help me out. That would be fantastic. With all that being said, y'all, I said a lot of words. So let's get into the show and learn how to adult. All right. Amber Lee, are you excited about season two? This is the first episode of season two. I'm so excited. Are you excited? I am so excited. It means the world to me that you support me in the podcast, obviously, but it it also means a lot that you're back. The first episode of season two, you were the first episode of season one. We've got a great topic today. We, you've already been on the podcast, but I'm going to ask you these things for the people that don't already know you. Tell me what your name is. Tell me your age. Tell me your location. Tell me what you do for work. Just give me a quick little snapshot of who you are, other than my wife. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, some of those answers have changed since the last time I've been on. Um, yeah. Name is Amberly Walker. Um, I am 24, living in Beaumont, Texas. And although I am currently on leave, I work for Dell Technologies as a technical sales representative. Wow. Big money, Texas, Dell Technologies. We've got all those changes. Goodness gracious. I wish we could dive into that, but that's not our topic today. Our topic today is pregnancy, right? And so, yeah, absolutely. We've had a long journey of pregnancy. We. At the time that we're recording this, it actually had just ended. The twins are about a week and a half old. Uh, and so we're, we're recording this to share our journey with pregnancy. Uh, because something that I didn't know is that there's a whole lot of people that are going through this journey of trying to get pregnant and they just can't. Right. You know, we see all of these pregnancies that happen that are on accident. And so I'm like, oh, well, it's just easy to get pregnant. Obviously, Uh, that's what they, you know, make all these things for. Uh, But it actually is difficult. And we didn't uh, have an easy journey as well. And so before I just give your story away, I want to ask you, where does your pregnancy journey begin? All right. where, Where does it begin for you? I would say that the pregnancy journey for me and for us began with getting off of birth control Um, because that obviously took a long time for my body to adjust to and I didn't realize just how long that was going to take. Yeah, yeah. So so your body had become accustomed to whatever this birth control was giving you. I'm not sciencey. And and so it took it took you a while for your body to get used to not having the sciencey stuff that's in birth control. Is that right? Right. Yeah. So I was on, um, the next one on birth control implant. So basically, um, they give you, you know, a local anesthetic. I think it's just a lidocaine shot. And then they do a small incision, insert the, um, the plastic piece of birth control that constantly pumps those hormones through your body. 
and they put it just right under the surface of your skin, um, apply lots of pressure, and then that's how your skin heals from that. Um, and that is a long-term form of birth control. So I was on it for, ooh, I think four years total. I had a three-year one. I got another one put in, and then we decided to make the choice to get it removed. So I was on that form of birth control for, I think, about four years. So my body was used to those hormones constantly being pumped through, and I just didn't realize how long it would take my body to bounce back and adjust to not having that influx of hormones all of the time. Fair enough. Fair enough. This is not the topic of the show, but I know that there's stigma around birth control. You know, it, birth control is not just about preventing pregnancy. It's also about other things. So I wanted to hear uh, what 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 do you see as the benefits of birth control and why it exists in our society today, even though that's not the topic of this show. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think a big benefit is, you know, preventing a pregnancy when you're not fully ready to support and experience a pregnancy. Um For me, I got on it because of just having really bad periods. I mean, it was pretty extreme. My body does not, does not handle that time of the month very well. And that actually plays into the the purpose of this episode, but I'll talk about that later. Yeah, so you're getting into the other issues that that you had during pregnancy, and so that actually right. is my next question. Is you know we had the, this issue of uh, getting off of birth control and the effects of getting off of birth control. What are the other issues that you experienced uh, trying to get pregnant? Yeah, so um, like I said, uh, I got the implant removed, and it was um, the November before we got married, actually, because I knew that it was going to take some time for it to get out of my system. I just didn't really realize how long that was going to be. Um, so I got the implant taken out in November, kind of just seeing how my body was going to adjust to that big change. Cause I mean, it is a pretty big change. Um, and then we got married in March and then I think it was in June, June of that next year. I was like, this is kind of taken a while. And I was kind of surprised. We were both surprised. I mean, we both kind of thought that it was going to happen a lot sooner for us. Um, so I made an appointment with my OBGYN. I actually saw a nurse practitioner. And because uh, I think my period was really, really late. So they were doing an ultrasound to try to see like what was going on. I thought I could have been pregnant, but I unfortunately wasn't. Um, my body just wasn't doing what it needed to do. My uterus wasn't shedding its lining. So I had to be given a different hormone to try to induce my period to come. Um, and then that was when I told her that I didn't think I was ovulating because once we started seriously trying, I was trying to track my ovulation each month, but every single ovulation test I took was low. Um, so then she started giving me medication to ovulate and then by numerous different ultrasounds, several different medical professionals had mentioned that I could have PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome. And then eventually I got the confirm, like confirmed diagnosis that I did in fact have PCOS. And that was why, A, my body wasn't ovulating, and B, we were just having a difficult time getting pregnant to begin with. Yeah, so that that's a huge journey. And the more and more we've talked to people about PCOS, I've learned that it's so common. There's so many people that have PCOS and uh, that, that it's preventing them from starting their family uh, in the traditional sense. Um, so... Yeah, that I think that was a big a big thing that that was um, that was an issue trying to get pregnant. What was has been surprising that happened to your pregnancy? I can think of a big one, but what, was there anything surprising that happened during your pregnancy? <laughs> I think the biggest surprise was that there were you know two babies in there, not just one. Um, I mean, it was kind of it's surprising, kind of not because I mean, just like I said with the PCOS, we were having um, follicle scans each month because we were trying to see if the medication that I was taking to ovulate was working and then we were able to determine, Oh yes, I was ovulating or no, I wasn't. Let's increase the medication. Um, and then I believe it was in July. I had an appointment and I hadn't been ovulating at least not successfully. And then we were told that there were two dominant follicles. And then come was it August or September? September, I had a positive pregnancy test. And then our very yep. first appointment, we found out it was twins. Right. 
Right. That, and that's a big, a really big deal. And so you mentioned this medication that's helping you ovulate. Is that correct? Like, can you tell me a little bit about the medication, the, the miracle pill uh, that, that made this happen, us starting our family? What, what is all that about? Yeah. So um, the brand name of medication is called Samara. Um, generic, it's called Letrozole. Basically, once you start your period, that's cycle day one, you take Letrozole um, during a period of time in your cycle. I think it's for about five days. And then that gives your body, I guess, the hint. Like, hey, you need to ovulate. You need to do what you're supposed to do. Um, and we went through, I believe it was two months medicated. But each month, they increased my dose because it wasn't working the first time. So um, I believe the dose we started out on that first month was two and a half milligrams. And then it didn't work, so we doubled it in June. And then we tried that dose again in July. It didn't work. We doubled it again. So I think we ended up on seven and a half milligrams of letrozole, and that works to help me ovulate. But then another kind of magical medication that I was given in, um, in August, I believe, my doctor decided to prescribe me metformin, which is a drug that's used for insulin resistance which a lot of people who have PCOS commonly suffer from. And then insulin resistant can cause things like pain, can cause infertility, tons of different things. So they decided to try that and maybe see if that would help. And then about two weeks later was when we got our positive pregnancy test. Wow. Yeah. There, there was a lot of, of medical uh, things that happened that really got us on the right track, which which is really, really important. And so we've talked about the surprising thing of, hey, yeah, there was two babies in there. You know, most people expect one when they get a pregnancy test that's positive. They're like, oh, it's one baby. We ended up with two babies. So uh, that's one big thing that was really surprising. Was there anything else that was su- surprising throughout your pregnancy that you that you learned? I have a, I have one. I, I don't know what yours is. Um, I mean, two things, piggybacking on the fact that there were two babies, I was kind of surprised that we maintained two babies the entire pregnancy because learning more and more about twin pregnancies, it's, it's very common that you can lose one, if not both of the babies. So I knew that that was a risk. So we were very blessed to, you know, actually end up with two babies. That was pretty fantastic. Another one is that I didn't experience as much morning sickness as I thought I would. Um, yeah. I've always been someone who was who's been scared of throwing up. That's been a fear of mine for my entire life. And I heard that with twin pregnancies, you usually have even more morning sickness because you have a, you have a, even more hormones. But I really didn't. I mean, I threw up once from heartburn. But other than that, I didn't have like the traditional, typical morning sickness where you're sick all morning or even all day. Yeah. Hashtag blessed. Um, mine so is... Yeah, I was going to say, what's yours? I'm interested to know. Yeah, my the thing that was surprising to me or the thing that I learned that, uh, that kind of changed my thoughts was really what the female body is capable of doing. You know, it, it's incredible to think that um, even in, in the traditional single pregnancy the the fact that they are growing a human being and, and you really can't comprehend it until you're holding the baby in your hand of my wife uh or, or my my person cre- made this out of their body right and that's just incredible to me and, and especially considering the tail end of the pregnancy seeing how uh miserable uh, you were, and I think most women are, uh, it, because of the the physical strain that growing a human, and not even to mention two humans, takes. Uh, and so that was my surprising thing. Uh, in, anything on that? Because I that that was a big topic. So yeah, I mean, I said this several times during our hospital stay, but it was just amazing to me that the babies were inside of my body and then were outside of my body, and it also. Um, it also, you know, made a lot of sense, the amount of pain that I was in and how uncomfortable I was because our babies were, you know, a pretty good size. They were relatively large for being twins. Um, so it was just a very surreal moment to realize that they were inside of me. Yeah. Oh, 
so real. It's so good. So real. Uh, so what were the hard, hardest challenges of pregnancy throughout the pregnancy? Uh, we haven't gotten to birth yet, but what were the hardest challenges, uh, of the pregnancy period specifically? Ooh, definitely the third trimester was the hardest. Um, yeah. just how, cause I mean, how large my belly was, how much pressure, cause the babies were so low in my pelvis. So I mean, all of the pressure, all of the pain. Sleeping, as you know, for me was essentially non-existent. Um, I had to sleep in our recliner, and even then, it was just hard to get comfortable. Um, and then, of course, when you're pregnant, you have to pee a lot. So I was getting up in the middle of the night to pee, and then it's hard to get comfortable after that. And the the discomfort was a big thing, um, especially in the third trimester for me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What what do you think? So we've got the challenges. I think the biggest challenge that I saw was the sleeping thing. I think the thing I was most concerned about was the sleeping thing, uh, mm-hmm. knowing that you weren't sleeping and knowing that the effects of not sleeping to the human body. I think that was the biggest thing that that I was concerned about. I right. think from like from from like the the male perspective, the biggest challenge throughout pregnancy for me was watching how miserable you were. Uh, you know. Watching that and not being able to do anything about it was right. a hard thing for for the the male in their relationship to to do because I'm a fixer, right? Something's wrong, I'm gonna fix it. Right. Uh, but there's nothing I can do about you being miserable because you're growing our humans. Uh, so I think from the male perspective, that was my right. Biggest yeah, challenge. I would I would tell people that. Yeah, I would tell people yeah. that all the time that you were in such a such a hopeless and like defenseless kind of phase because you saw that I was miserable and you saw that I was in pain and you saw that I wasn't really sleeping, but you couldn't do anything about it. You couldn't take that from me. We couldn't do anything to help. I mean, I tried doing things to help, but nothing really worked. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I mean, obviously I was the one going through it, but I obviously felt for you because you see the person that you love in so much pain and discomfort, but then you can't do anything about it. So that's a really, really tough situation to be in. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a good time to pause and and just talk about something that we talk about all the time, which is just the toxic expectations on uh, the on the men's side during a pregnancy. Right. We see all these these reels and TikToks about, oh, if if I'm not sleeping, he's not sleeping. We've got to go through this together. Why? You know, I I know you and I think it's toxic. Can you kind of give me your reasoning on why why that is uh, a toxic trait? Well, it's toxic because it's like I'm miserable, so you by default have to be miserable as well. Like that's just that's just not the case. I mean, at the end of the day, especially during pregnancy, I mean, we were both working. I was working from home at least, so I at least had that luxury. But I mean, you had to get up and you know take care of the dogs and go work and do your job. So I mean, obviously, I couldn't keep you up until midnight every single day when you were waking up at 6 a.m. I got to sleep in a little bit more, so I was able to actually fall asleep. I could at least sleep a little bit longer, but my insomnia didn't have to be your insomnia as well. That just didn't really make sense to me. Yeah, and I promise I didn't pay her to say that. Uh, so I, I, think, <laughs> <laughs> I, I absolutely agree, and I think another ar- argument that I would push is that if – you know, the, the wife in, in their relationship is obviously struggling, not sleeping in a, in a hard physical state. You need someone strong enough that's going to p- pick up any slack that's there, right? Because the wife is not sleeping and is not able to do certain things physically, then that puts it on the husband to do it, right? And if the husband is not getting the rest, if the husband's not getting what he needs, then... Uh, it, it's just an unrealistic expectation to think, oh, everybody's going to be miserable. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna stick a pin in that bubble, freaking TikTokers. <laughs> we've been we've been uh, crapping on those people that yeah, think we've been, that we've been going off slightly. <laughs> So what is the best part about pregnancy? We talked about the challenges of pregnancy. What are the what was the best part about pregnancy? If you can narrow it down to one thing, if you needed to go into two things, that's fine with me as well. My that's easy question. My absolute favorite thing while being pregnant was just feeling them move. 
Um, Cause I mean, kind of the entire pregnancy for me, I mean, I would forget that I was pregnant pretty often, except for, you know, the final month or two, maybe. Um, but I would forget <laughs> that I was pregnant. So then moving was just such a cool feeling and it reminded you of like the life that you're growing inside of you because they're moving and they're doing all of the things and kicking like crazy. Um, but that was just like the coolest thing to be able to experience. And that's what I tell everyone. That's my favorite part of uh, being pregnant was just being able to feel them and knowing that they were safe and cared for. Yeah, my favorite thing was people like let you cut in line because you're you're pregnant, right? And and you get premium parking uh, sometimes. So <laughs> any, I'm just I'm just kidding. No, feeling the move was awesome. Even from like externally, it was the uh, uh, by far one of the best things, best feelings to feel them kick as they were growing. Um, and I'll just throw that this in there. Uh, H-E-B, right? The the parking with child. That's not secondary handicap. That's parking with child. Okay, I'm just going to get <laughs> off my soapbox there because it, I feel strongly about that as well. So, you know, we, we, we personally, we know a lot of people that are going through PCOS. We have, know a lot of people that are going through infertility issues. I think a lot of people are going to listen to this that we don't even know that are going through these issues. And so, you know, I just want to real quick go through some some things that we were nervous about going through this just to encourage that you know it, it's it's okay to have these feelings and you can come out the other side and so what were the were that some of the things that you were most most nervous about going through the pregnancy i mean even whenever we were trying to get pregnant like so this thing just on the pcos and the struggles that we had i was really frustrated because i felt like my body wasn't doing one of the things that it was literally created and designed to do like i felt like i was a failure because i couldn't get pregnant on my own mm. so that was a really hard thing to kind of get through like i'm not doing the one thing or not the one thing but one of the big things that the woman the woman's body is created to do so that was like incredibly discouraging um and then I think the biggest thing during pregnancy was just like trying to be mindful of the fact that I wanted to be the best mom that I could be and like how I could do that. Mm. How did you think that you could do that? Being the best mom that you could be? I mean, I knew that I would make it happen no matter what, because I've always wanted to be a mom. That's always just been something that I have wanted to do. Uh, my three older sisters have kids. So I've been an aunt since I was five years old. So I've always just been around kids and I've seen my sisters be some pretty incredible moms. So I've always looked up to them and I always wanted to have a family and I wanted to be a mom. So I always knew that like that intrinsic motivation for me would make me be the best mom that I could be. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So did the, these things that you had anxiety about, did they end up being true? Did you prove them false? Were they kind of in the middle? What, how did it turn out? I mean, with the PCOS thing, I definitely proved that one wrong because, I mean, although I needed medication to get pregnant, I was still able to do it, and I was still able to carry the pregnancy, maybe not fully to term, but, I mean, they got to come home with us, so I could, I call that a win. I called them, I carried them as close to term as I could, um, yeah. so that was definitely a win, um, and then, I mean, I've only been a mom for, you know, a short time, but I think I'm doing the best that I can, so... Amen. I think you're doing an amazing job. Amazing Mom Award goes to you. Uh, so <laughs> that was a, a that was kind of I would say the early feelings of anxiety. What would you say the late third trimester feelings of anxiety, nervousness? Uh, what what were you feeling there? Because that's a little bit different than early pregnancy. Yeah, late late pregnancy anxiety. I was just terrified of actually giving birth, and I know you know this because I talked about it all the time regardless of how miserable I was and in so much and how much pain I was in, I was terrified of getting birth because I mean, I've never been through it before. And then with twins, you never really know what's going to happen. If it's going to be a vaginal delivery or if it's going to be a C-section or if you'll be, you know, the small percentage of very real instances where people have one of each. And that was my biggest fear was trying to go for vaginal and then having baby A, having Jeffrey vaginally, but then having a little Miss Sassy Pants Natasha flip and then mm. having to have a C-section for her. And I really didn't want to have to heal both ways. I've heard terrible things about recovery from a vaginal birth. 
I've heard terrible things about recovery from a C-section. They're incredibly different, but both carry their own challenges. So I really didn't want to have to heal in both places. So my way of kind of taking control of that was opting for a C-section from basically the beginning. I mean, I kind of went back and forth because both babies were head down. So I kept being told that I was a good candidate to try vaginally. But that was the whole thing is the key word was try vaginally. So my mm. biggest fear was that something would have to happen and I would have either one vaginally and one C-section or I would labor for however many hours and then I would need an emergency C-section anyway because my body wouldn't be progressing in the way that it needed to for a vaginal birth. So I mm. kind of just kind of, I just took the control of that. I decided for a C-section and then that's what ended up happening. Yeah. Yeah, the uncertainty of that situation in a twin pregnancy specifically uh, is very worrisome. I, I think another thing uh, uh, that you didn't mention that was always kind of in the back of our mind uh, with the twin pregnancy, the the rate of death is just so much higher uh, right. because of the nutrients in the in the in the stomach and, and all of those things. And so I think another thing that was in the back of our mind is like, yes, we started this pregnancy out with it being twins. Uh, but we were always kind of in the back of our mind nervous that we may not have both. And um, we're incredibly blessed that we got to have both and we got to have them uh, at the weight that they were at and at the the uh, health that they came out. It was just incredible. Um, but we're going to get to birth in just a moment. But I think that that was another thing that was just so in, in the back of our mind the whole time. A anything on that? Yeah, piggybacking on that, I mean, the second you started talking, I thought you were going to bring up what I was about to bring up. Another fear for me, I don't think you were as worried about this, but one worry for me was the NICU. I was wondering how much care they were going to need, depending on how early they came. Um, I've heard many stories of twin moms having to leave the hospital with both of their babies there or only being able to come home with one baby and having to leave the other behind at the NICU. So, I mean, granted, they're in the best situation possible for their health, but... I was always worried about um, the kind of supports they would need after birth, um, the kind of care they would need in the NICU, and just any type of health complications for them that could have happened. Right, right. And I think as we got closer to birth, the more I thought about it as if they are in the NICU, that's okay. They're going to get the care that they need to come home. And the main thing that I was concerned about was that eventually they would come home. Uh, so I I completely agree. That was definitely a concern. Uh, but something that I think people, you really can have comfort. The people that are in the NICU are some of the most caring people that I ever have ever encountered. They were just incredible people. Uh, so shout out to all, all the nurses out there, but especially the NICU nurses. Oh, absolutely. So, so you mentioned earlier that you had a C-section, and so I just want to talk a little bit about what a C-section is. Um, do you want to describe what a C-section is? You went through it. What happened? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so essentially, a C-section is where um, you deliver in an operating room, obviously. It is a very major abdominal surgery. Um, but unlike most surgeries for a C-section, you're typically not put all the way under unless you absolutely have to. Um, so the doc or the, not necessarily doctors, but the anesthesiologist will give you a spinal. Um, so that may basically just makes you numb from about your ribs down. Um, and then if the spinal doesn't work for whatever reason, then they'll have to put you completely under anesthesia or if there's other complications. Um, thankfully in, in our case, um, I was just given the spinal. So I was still awake during all of it. I just couldn't feel most of it which was good um, but they do a horizontal incision um, below your belly button so between your belly button and your and your you know area your, your area the area um, yeah the area um, so it's a horizontal incision goes through many layers of you know skin and tissue and then they pull the babies out there that's you go the best, that's the best least graphic way that I can describe it very good. I, I love that. And, and something that I thought was interesting was how like aware you were in, in, during the C-section laying on the operating table. You know, you're obviously paralyzed from the ribs down, but you're you're very aware. We could have recorded a podcast in the middle of this with how aware you were during oh, the yeah. procedure. I was able uh, to talk and everything I know. Obviously, 
you weren't allowed in the operating room when they were giving the spinal. You came in once I was already on the table and like getting ready to go. But the first thing you said to me was, oh, wow, you're, you're really awake. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's crazy. Craziness. So just really quickly, I'm running out of time, but really quickly, there's stigma around C-sections. And I just kind of want to hear your, your response to that stigma because I don't really understand it. I want you to describe it really quickly because I want to get to a portion where just we'll, we'll just give some uh, advice to the people out there that are struggling. So what's the stigma around C-sections? Why are people upset? Yeah, so a lot of the stigma around C-sections is that people say that it's the easy way out or you're not really a mother because you don't go through the vaginal birth. Um, essentially, you know, a major surgery is essentially deemed as the easy way out for having a baby because they just cut you open. You're not going through hours of labor or pushing or any of that stuff. So a lot of people tend to see C-section uh, moms as not a real mom because they don't go through the traditional method of delivery. Yeah, it's very odd to me when you told me that for the first time. I was like, well, I've got very real babies that are crying and needing, di needing diaper changes. So, uh, you know, very real babies equal very real mom and dad. But hey, everybody's got an opinion. Some pe opinions are just wrong. Uh, so with that being said... <laughs> I'm feeling very bold for season two. Goodness gracious. <laughs> Let's get to a portion. For those people that are going through PCOS, they're seeking medication, they're having to go through that medical advice, people that are losing babies, What, what is your just comment of motivation and inspiration going through this experience? We didn't, it, it, it wasn't easy. It wasn't clear. It, it, it was a challenge. It was a journey for, for, for our pregnancy. So I just kind of want to get your final piece of motivation for, for those people that are out there listening to this. Yeah, I think the biggest piece of motivation or even advice I could give is just to be your own advocate. I mean, whenever I was going through the whole PCOS potential diagnosis, I had had, I think, two or three medical professionals mention that my ovaries looked polycystic. Not a, clear not a clear definition or diagnosis or anything, but they said that it appeared that way. So the very next appointment I had with my doctor, I was very direct and I asked her, I said, so doctors have been saying this to me. Do I have polycystic ovarian syndrome? Because if I do, I would like to start tackling that now so that I don't have as long of a road to getting pregnant as I possibly could. Because sometimes doctors are not as willing to listen to the patients, especially if they're a first time mom or not even pregnant yet, um, or not even willing to prescribe those medications. They're more, they're more willing to just see if the body will do what it needs to do with time. But sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes, you know, medical intervention is needed and necessary in order to get the desired outcome. So I would just say to be um, your own advocate and speak up. And if you think something is wrong, do something about it, say something about it. Amen. Amen. We are not doctors, but we still have an opinion, right? It can be wrong. Like I just said, some opinions are wrong and that's fine. Right. Uh, and it doesn't I hurt love to ask. that advice. It doesn't hurt to ask. Maybe they'll explain it in a way that will make you uh, make it make sense to you. Right. Mm -hmm. Because it has to make right. sense to you. You have to feel comfortable at some point. Right. And so I, I completely agree. I think that's great motivation, great uh, advice. And so I we're running out of time, so I am going to end this show. I'm going to cut you off, Amber Lee, and this is my show, so I can do that. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so I appreciate you so much for being the first episode of Season 2. It's going to be an incredible season. We're going to learn a lot out there. Uh, just so because this episode was real medical, I just want to throw out there that we did not throw out any medical advice. We are not medical professionals. This is for entertainment purposes only. We are trying to inspire and get people through this tough time if they're going through it. And so this is just, this is not medical advice. Go seek your own medical advice from doctors, physicians, obviously. Right. We are not doctors. We are just sharing our own personal experience. So while this happened for us, the exact same might not happen for you. Amen. Amen to that. And I, I, just before I end the show, I want to also just touch on community and how important it is. Can you just touch on how community affected your experience as a pregnant lady? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, P 
people checking on you, making sure you're okay, asking if you need anything. It really helps to just have people in your corner who are going to support you. And during pregnancy, for sure, but even after birth, I mean, having the meal train and having people bring us food when the last thing we want or need to be doing is cooking. It's really nice to just have people around who are supportive and just are there and say, if you need anything, reach out, let me know. Their door is always open. Amen. Amen. We've got an incredible, incredible community around us from uh, the people that we know at church, from the Facebook groups that you were in, from the people that I work with contributing and throwing us parties. I mean, it's just been incredible the amount of support that we've gotten and just just another inspiration of if you're going through this, you have to have community around you. It doesn't work without community. Uh, so very, very important. Thank you so much, Amber. Again, I, I really appreciate it. You are the best wife in the world. I'm going to get you that on a coffee mug. Just kidding. We have too many coffee mugs. I'll get you a cup maybe. Uh, so, I know. You said I can't get more cups unless you throw some away. So. Exactly. Maybe we'll just throw some away. <laughs> With that being said, y'all, go follow the podcast on Instagram and Facebook at HaddoAdultTW and be on the lookout for the next episode. I love you guys. Shout out to season two. Shout out to Amber. Shout out to me. This is going to be the best season ever.